Aun du shmayan at padash shmach te the malkutach nehwe suyanach ekanna du shmaya abbar a haulan lahma tsunkan an yawmana washwuqlan hawbain ekanna tab hanan shwaqan la hayawain la ta'lan la nisyona illa qassan min bisha mitol di la khi malkuta hayla tushbahta alam well, today's topic, uh, one of my favorite um, things about Jesus, he, he we, we often reference him in, in relation to the prophets and the people who came before him. And uh, that, that's all good because he, he did learn um, and, and grasped a lot of the, the foundational teachings about, about humanity, about our interaction with spirituality, with, with our soul, with, um, with each other, by studying, but also by observing. He, he had a, a, a unique perspective, and each, each one of the prophets before him had a unique perspective, as, as each one of us has, has a, a unique perspective. Um, and he took his unique perspective and, and the teachings of the people before him and created something new. Um, so, it, and that, that's why his movement went beyond the, the tribal um, religion that, that Judaism was becoming. Uh, the, I, and I don't think uh, Judaism had the intention of, be a, of being a tribal uh, religion. It is definitely designed as a global universal religion. It has a universal truth to it. And, and until uh, Moses structured it around the 12 tribes, um, it, it, it did, it, I don't think it had that built into it. Um, so he, Moses differentiated and created more of a political structure and so forth. And I think uh, from that point on, there is a lot of struggle within the, the community um, but with uh, and between the prophets and Moses's what he instituted uh, to try to open it up and make it more global. But since all the prophets were mainly from these tribes, uh, they often when when they were tested, they had to, they they leaned towards um, serving the tribes and and their nation uh, than going universal and global. Though in, in all of their writings, I don't think there's an exception of uh, in the prophets uh, where they they uh, they didn't struggle or try to bring that um, universal light to to the other groups and and preach it within their own communities. Um, I think the story of, of Jonah is a great example of, of a prophet who really struggled because he was getting the message to open up globally and, and work with the, with, with the, the non-Jewish non uh, people he was an, interacting with, and he resisted it. He, he felt like, no, I'm, I'm in the line of, of, uh, of these prophets, and, and, and I'm part of these tribes, and that's, he, he went through that turmoil. So may, maybe one of these days, uh, I know Dr. Eric has done a at, at least one talk, if not more, on, on uh, the prophet Jonah. And, but um, maybe one of these days, one of us will do that as well. So, um, so, th so th th where that takes me is to Jesus. He started putting fundamental cracks into that, the, that, that, that uh, dome that was built around the, the, the God of, of the, our universal God who was locked into the, the uh, Judaism. And uh, that all, all the tribes around there, uh, maybe the Samaritans are probably an exception, but most of the tribes around the area and, and the, the, uh, the, the people who came with the Roman Empire and the Egyptian Empire, the Assyrians and so forth, they, they still had the, the um, multi-god uh, perspective. Uh, you know, they, they, were, um, they, they had a pantheon or they had uh, more, more gods than, than the one god and they had all, all different ones serving different uh, purposes. So, so Jesus wanted to take that God of, of uh, Abraham and bring him back into, uh, in, into a universal understanding. But his message wasn't focused on the, this, this relationship. He knew that God exists between us. 
if we focus our whole spiritual journey on trying to please a universal, uh, invisible being that we often perceive living in the clouds or somewhere above us or somewhere in the universe, uh, we, we lose a major aspect of the God of Abraham and the God of Jesus who lives amongst us. And that, that, that distinction is, is so important. So what, one, of, one of the things, and this is really where the, this the, t- today I'm hoping to go with you, is that the, the fundamental force that s- motivates most people who are not in touch with their spirituality is fear. And I, I remember not too long ago, probably in the last 20 years or so, we started seeing those bumper stickers um, that, that say no fear. And every time I talk about Jesus, I see him sticking that sticker on the back of the donkey when he entered uh, Jerusalem or uh, whenever he, he walked on his, his uh, uh, the, the, the bag he carried with him, he probably had those stickers that says no fear. Because f- fear is a very powerful force in, in, in our dynamic, in our lives. And if we let it creep in, uh, in, and it takes many forms. Uh, it, it starts motivating our whole way of behaving. So what, what, what did Jesus do? And, and how did he live? Um, and he had a healthy, um, healthy perspective on things that he should be worried about. Um, but, but he had a health, as I said, it's, it's a healthy uh, uh, attitude. So from the beginning of his ministry, he knew that if he makes mistakes, he is going to be accountable. And it de- depending on the type of mistake, it, it's, he's going to be more accountable. So we, we see that come when he came out of the experience in the desert. As his ministry evolved, and as he was starting to see that he probably is going to pay a heavy price for this new movement, um, he started even being more daring in some ways, and yet maybe more conservative in others. So uh, he is uh, when when he was like uh, we we read in the episode when he healed the girl. When he, th- th- this is very um, a, a big part of his ministry was healing ministry. But as he advanced his ministry, he wanted to spend less time just dealing with healing. He, he was teaching his apostles, his disciples, the fundamentals of how to heal. And he sent them on healing missions and uh, still preaching that the kingdom of, of heaven or the kingdom of God. But he, he did not want his, himself to be known as this miracle doctor. So when, when he healed the, uh, uh, the girl who was probably in a state of coma. They thought she was dead and they, they had already the mourners downstairs singing and so forth. Uh, when, when Jesus showed up, he had a, he, he knew that the faith of her, her father really what, what brought him in. Uh, he, and he, he had a feeling that this is not, she's not gone yet. Um, and he, he worked with her, um, held her and, and, and got her out of that state uh, whether it was a coma, most likely it was a coma, as, as he did with, with Lazarus. Um, and people who went into coma, then they, they didn't have, uh, as we, in most cases today, I mean, today we have like medically induced comas, so we know how to bring people back from that. But sometimes people go into coma via, you know, through accidents or some health episodes, and we can't bring them back. We can keep them alive, we can keep them hooked in, uh, but we typically have a very hard time to bring them back con- consciously and, and, and get their brain to function again. Um, there are a lot of books and a lot of movies that that play with that concept, but uh, ultimately medicine is still, we're getting closer. And in some cases, as I said, we use it even as part of our healing methods. When people have massive injuries, we put them into coma and then we bring them out of it when their body can handle other functions besides just that focusing on the healing of, of the uh, whatever organ is, is injured. But Jesus brought her back. And, and what did he tell his, his, uh, her family and the disciples who were with him, wh- whoever witnessed that episode? He said, go and tell no one. So he, he understood that in some of these cases, if his ministry was known f- for that kind of work, it was going to distract from his, fun- his, his focused message about the kingdom. 
and he needed to continue to travel and and teach that 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 message and develop it in his uh, in his followers. He and he at that point he was starting to see that his time is getting limited because he was being noticed by the the priests, the Sadducees, the um, uh, any, anybody who was the Romans were starting to to notice him. So and and he when when people when get that kind of fame, it it's it a healthy attitude to kind of weigh your options. We see that today in, in people who win the lottery. It's like we, you know, one day you walk into a Circle K or 7-Eleven or your, your supermarket or gas station, buy a ticket and you're just a, a no, nobody. Um, three days later, you're on TV accepting a check for, you know, with, with two, three commas in it. And now you're, you're famous. Maybe for all the wrong reasons. Now you're famous because you have a lot of money and you hear about a lot of stories of people losing their marriages, some of them committing suicide uh, because they're not prepared for that moment. They, they don't go and, and, and do you know that, that prep work that needs to happen. So Jesus was in that position. He basically won, won the spiritual lottery and had followers and his movement was on, on, uh, on, on the upswing. And he knew that attention, because he helped somebody with a coma, was not the kind of attention he needed. So he was controlling that. He was not a afraid of, uh, of the healing. He was afraid of what people will do when they hear about it. So the same thing uh, happens, not, not, not in bib biblically speaking, or, or based on, on what is written in, in uh, the Gospels, Soon after that, it, it, his apostles are starting to kind of see that he is special, and yet he's trying to develop them to be special like him. So he he, he has a, a discussion with them and, and asks them, what, what do you think? What's, what's out there what, about me? And, and let, let me read this part. I think I lost that part. Um, <clears throat> okay, that's uh, Ma Matthew 16, 20. So I'll give you the, the verses. The, the, the previous verse about uh, the, the girl was Matthew 9, 26, or it's also in Luke chapter 8. But in Matthew 16, 20, <clears throat> Prior to that, it starts in 15. He said to them, who do you say that I am? So now he's talking to his, his uh, followers. Simon Peter answered saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered saying to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. So he didn't call him Peter there. He called him Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood did not reveal it to you, but my father in heaven. I tell you also that you are the stone. So here, this is why we, we know that Peter was behind a lot of the Ma Matthew writing. Going on to, to verse 20, then he charged his disciples not to tell any man that he was the Christ. So just like telling the, the parents not to tell anybody about the healing, he and he he also said that to other other. Uh, uh, other people he healed he told them don't tell anybody in that case though he told them go to your uh, to the synagogue go to your rabbi get the papers that you were cleansed and then you basically fulfill that because you're going to get a lot of attention you and, and that will distract you from um, getting back into society so so he he had a good understanding of when to uh, declare things when to be on the cutting edge and when to hold off and make make a plan before you share that kind of thing. Now, though he did tell them not to tell anybody, we got that in writing. So obviously, uh, either he okayed it later or shared it with them later. And so he he was constantly working with the, the dynamic of what society expects and how society reacts and how uh, he 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 wanted to manage. The narrative and how he wanted to prepare his disciples so that they could function. The, the most uh, dramatic, uh, no, no fear, so healthy fear, no, no fear, is when, when he talks about the, the spirit. And that's really where, where I wanted to start, but th this is how things happen sometimes. So in, in chapter 10, verse 28, he, he tells 
he's he's talking about the different forces that come into play in in our lives. And, and at the end of uh, that statement, he do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but who cannot kill the soul. But above all, be afraid of him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Now, hell, uh, if you've been listening to us from the Aramaic perspective, is mental torment. So what, what, what he is talking about here, and, and I know that I've talked about this before, but it's so critical for his teaching and it's so critical for his disciples to understand that, us, ultimately, is that the, when, when you're dealing with a situation today, okay, you, you, you will watch TV, and let's say you watch the news, and uh, or you watch your ring feed from from your neighborhood right break-ins are happening i know so many people who are vested heavily in guns and bullets uh, security systems and so forth and they it's a big focus of their life every time they leave home they have to punch in the codes and they have to come back and punch in the codes and it's it's a constant thing that's weighing on you to me that's a perfect example of somebody who's killing the soul because now you are suspect of your neighbors, of any foreign car that drives across. If you own a gun, then you're constantly trying to figure out how do I keep it safe? How do I keep people from getting it? How do I um, use it when it's time to use it? Am I trained? And we hear about a lot of cases where those guns never get used against somebody who's actually threatening your life, but they're, used, they're either misused by the people who are in the home or by somebody who steals them. So, so those, those are the kinds of things that uh, it, Jesus was peeling in th this is anything that consumes you. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, is, is fundamental fear in us is lack of food. Yeah, we live in times, especially if you, you know, I know there are parts of the world that still struggle with that and, and in a major way, we still hear, in 2023, we still hear of famines. Uh, it's mind boggling to me with, with the kind of science and ability that we have, we have some nations dumping food and, and throwing it away and, and putting early expiration date on it. And some nations, literally kids and, and adults are dying of hunger. But Jesus dealt with that specific case. And, and I, I like this story uh, better in Luke because it has a key in it. We, we, we probably all know it. If you've studied the, the Bible or went to church, that we, we love talking about the feeding of, of the thousands. And in, in Luke, I like it because Jesus, uh, now the, the, the scenario here is Jesus' followers are, are coming and, and this is probably near Eastern exaggeration, but let's take it face value. Let's say there were thousands of men, they say 4,000, 5,000, there are a couple of stories. Okay, 5,000 men, which means that you probably can easily double that or maybe triple it or quadruple it if you add women and children who might have been in the crowd. So uh, so we, this is a huge crowd for Galilee. They're following this teacher. He's in remote areas. Uh, they, these are hillish areas. They're not heavily populated with cities. And he, they, they, he finishes talking to them. And his immediate, let me drink some water. <clears throat> He, he he finishes talking to them, and his disciples come, the, the, the close ones who are basically uh, keeping an eye on Jesus and on the crowd. They come to him and they tell him, hey, these people are hungry. And uh, so why don't you dismiss them? Tell them to go to the villages near here and the farms near here so they can fend for themselves and get food. Now, the, if you take the, the story, uh, the, the way it's written in Matthew, it doesn't have a lot of the, uh, the clues. But if you read it in Luke, um, and Luke 9, 13. <clears throat> so I'm doing more, more of Luke than I usually do, which is okay. Now, 9, 13. Jesus said to them, you give them to eat. So this is his attitude. So it, they come to him, you know, it's like, hey, we have a ton of people. So Jesus tells his disciples, you give them to eat. He's teaching a lesson here. So what's the disciples' uh, response? But they said, we do not have more than five loaves of bread and two fishes. Unless you go and buy food for all th th this people, for there were about 5,000 men. So Jesus said to them, 
make them sit down. This is this is really the 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 clue, the key, the the lesson. Sit down in groups, fifty men in each group. Okay, so the first thing he did, and I, and I've read the story many times, and it, it never really jumped at me. So what he did is he created a personal space. So that was the first trick: is he created the personal space where you're not speaking on a microphone saying, "Hey, if you have any extra food, share with one another." He, here he's saying go break them into smaller groups. So now I'm sitting next to somebody and I can look at them in the eye and they can look me in the eye. Okay, so this is the, the, first, the first perspective. This is how Jesus was opening the hearts. When you make that human connection, right? Now, and Jesus took the five loaves. Now he, may, he stood amongst the, these groups that are, are gathered. He, he stood between them and he took what he had and he broke it, he, he prayed, and he broke it, and he passed it to them. He didn't keep, keep it to, for himself and his group of 50. He passed it to them. So he now removed that, that fear of holding on. Okay, so how, how often do we deal with that? Where, um, and, and, you know, I, I, I came up with a bunch of examples as I was reading this. It's like, oh, my God, the times that I've been to concerts where they, you can bring your own cooler, we always packed that cooler with a lot, you know, it was as almost as heavy leaving as, as it was when it came in. Uh, camping trips. I've gone on camping trips. It's like two nights for the weekend. And we stop at the, the supermarket on the way there, besides the stuff that we bring from home. And we load up, you know, two, two coolers and cars with bags and chips, things that, that do not need cooling and so forth, eggs for like a month. And, and we, we do that. Now, imagine that same scenario if you're in, in, on your camping trip and the family shows up and they have nothing, absolutely nothing. If, if they put a little sign by their campsite or by the entrance of the camp and they said, we, we're starving, any leftovers, anything extra you have, we'd love to share it with you, especially if they can look you in the eye as, as you're sitting around the, the fire co cooking your, your meal. It, it changes the dynamic, right? And we always have more than what we need. And this is what Jesus knew about the people. This is, again, a culture. Uh, people in the Near East, when, you know, we're here, we probably pack a couple, you know, granola bars, uh, some uh, energy bars. I've, I've done biking trips where I've loaded my shirt with bananas and things like that. So we always have something. And if somebody forgot during the biking uh, uh, ride or, or during camping or the concert, it's so easy to reach and say, you know, here, here is one. And if each one of us did that, we probably would bury that person with food. So, so this is where Jesus was going. He, first, he, he said, we, abundance is there all around us. And people do carry that. And if you touch them personally, when you break them into groups and look them in the eye, they're willing to open up and share. So again, this is, he took a very fundamental fear. And he, he dismantled it by, by opening the hearts of other people. In our communities, we have a lot of people who could give to food banks. We have a lot of people who, who could give um, to, to charity that ends up supporting food banks. So, so we have the same dynamic. And it, it takes place today as, as it did before. It's maybe a little bit less personal than, than these communities, but I, I feel the same way. One, one of my favorite t TV uh, uh, shows I, I watch is uh, John Oliver, um, and I, I don't agree necessarily with everything he says, but, but he, his key uh, contribution, when he's very playful. If you haven't seen him, uh, you, know, you don't have to see him on my account, but what he does is anytime he like banters with a city or, or the mayor of, of some place. And these are places in Japan and New Zealand and so forth. He's, he's very, very globally uh, or universally known. His, his main contribution, he doesn't cut a check to a, an individual or to a city. He always does a $25,000 uh, contribution to, to their food bank. So this is his way of doing what Jesus is doing here, is sharing with people who need. He, so his heart is open, and that's how he takes HBO money and puts it into a food bank. Um, it, it's one of my favorite charities, by the way, uh, is, is food banks. What, what, whatever community, whatever drives, I, I love it. That's because it's so fundamental, and, and we are sometimes not, we don't see it because we have full refrigerators. So, so, so what Jesus' system is, 
it, when you know when when he said that you know the the one who kills the soul, the one who kills the soul is the one who gives you the uh, the message that there isn't enough food for all of us, there isn't enough money for all of us. Lock your doors, close you know to, to turn your lights off, buy guns, set up security systems because the, the world is a bad world out there. Well, the more we buy into that, the more we are not living, the more we're missing. Uh, the, the bite that we take our, out of our food because we're keeping it away from somebody else or throwing those cans away before they, you know, when, when they expire instead of putting them to the food bank before they expire. That's that's what Jesus was shifting in his society. And it, it, think about this. This is 2000 and some years ago b- before food banks. But that that's that's the, the model that he put there. He basically told people, if you have extra, share it with the person next to you. And before you knew it, everybody ate. And because they, they put it in the communal basket, uh, there was so much leftover for the next day or the next group that shows up. That he, his, um, his understanding of the psychology, not only of Near Eastern or Middle Eastern people, but his universal understanding of how to work with these things and how we can use them today is what makes his message so relevant. <clears throat> okay, so I talked about hunger. I talked about um, he- healthy fear and, and, and understanding. So with, with that, if, if you have situations where you're doing good works uh, and, and want to be um, aware of how the community is taking it, t- take that extra step mentally, two, two, three steps. I always ask people when, when they're talking about, I need a different job, or I need to make more money, or I need a bigger home, or whatever it is, is, okay, let, let's sit down here and play with that scenario. Are you prepared for the extra cost of energy? Are you are you prepared for the extra responsibility? Are you prepared? And, and the answer could always be yes or, oh, I didn't think about that. I need to plan for it. So that's, that's to me, that's healthy. Uh, I, I won't call it fear, it's preparation. And that's where Jesus was with, with the statements of don't tell this to anybody. So the Messiah one was very dangerous because it was a, a, a label that he was not, he did not want, we call it Messiah, that the, the, the anointed one is somebody who had expectations and he didn't care for those expectations. He cared about changing his society then without any titles, with creating actually an equal uh, playing field. So that, that was his, his preparation. <clears throat> okay, I'll do this this one last part. The, the other thing, actually, I, I have two, two, two additional pieces that I want to cover real quickly. One of them is that the other, the other part that we have uh, fear of is the law. And that the and societal law. So there is like legal law and societal law. And Jesus dealt with that a lot. And, and he he wanted to shift the way we we look at the law and how we look at tradition, because tradition is so strong. Um and t- today is as strong as usually people think of, of uh you know, fiddler on the roof or something like that, because they, they bring in the old traditions. But today we have our own traditions. And usually it's very hard to break away from that. That's one of those fears is, is how do you take something that's been unquestioned for so long? And yet, um, and, and, and Jesus was looking at it and going like, okay, how can I break that and bring in something brand new to replace it? And in one of the episodes here that that uh, uh, he he tackles that issue is in in Luke uh, in sorry Matthew chapter fifteen verses one through nine. Now here he's tackling he's he's playing on on multiple levels, but he was being accused of not washing his hands uh, before he ate. And that's, again, tradition. It became part of the, the culture, maybe it became part of their religion. Um, and he, he's basically saying, your, your mind, you, you narrowed all this. The, now, the food that I eat, now we know washing your hands before you eat is a good idea because of the germs. But it's not because, and, and that's not what Jesus was, was saying to avoid, but he was saying that people who are judging you, there are people who are keeping the, the, the book, keeping the, the law, the count, 
uh, are, are critiquing people who, who did that. He wanted to go after really what the problem is. And it, it's really worth reading. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead. So this is chapter 15 in Matthew verses 1 through 9. Because he, he, he talks about so, so many different things. And then I want to finish with the 10, 10 verses after that. <clears throat> Then the tax collectors and sinners drew near him, to him, to hear him. Oh, sorry, I think I, I, I meant Luke when I went. I did this. Let me just sec. Yep, I think it was. Oh, I am. I am in Luke. That's why I'm reading Luke. Okay. Then the Pharisees. I, I knew I was in the wrong spot. Then the Pharisees and scribes from Jerusalem came up to Jesus, saying, Now, Pharisees and scribes, so these are the keepers of the law, keepers of the tradition. And they said, Why do you, why do your disciples disregard the tradition of the elders? And they do not wash their hands when they eat. Okay, so they're trying to trap him. Jesus answered, saying to them, Why do you also disregard? the commandment of God on account of your tradition. For God said, so now he's turning the table on them, honor your father and your mother, and whoever curses his father or his mother, let him be put to death. Massive, massive uh, punishment. But you say, whoever says to a father or to a mother, whatever you may be benefited from me is korban, which is uh, an offering to God. So now they, they shifted the, the honor your, your, your parents and take good care of your parents to something uh, religious and made it part of the religion and that you're basically fulfilling uh, something towards God, like you're cl clearing something with God when, when you're doing that, that decent human thing if you have good parents. He need not honor his father or his mother. So, so you have rendered useless the word of God for the sake of your tradition. So again, tradition now trumped even the, 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 the original uh, meaning. Oh, you hypocr hypocrites, the prophet Isaiah well prophesies concerning you saying, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me and they worship me in vain when they teach the doctrines of the commandments of men. So they took a spiritual concept and made it a commandment of men. And that's what we live by a lot of our lives that we take for granted. A lot of the, thing, the, the sayings, a lot of the traditions are what I call commandments of men. So he's taking it back to spirituality. And I think the key is, is in the next 10 verses. Then he called the people and said to them, listen and understand. It is not what enters into the mouth which defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. That is what defiles a man. And, and I love this because it is constantly, I, I might do it just one day of like the funnies of the disciples or something like that. Then his disciples came up and said to him, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to this because he, he explains it. Do you know that the Pharisees who heard the saying were offended? But he answered, saying to them, Every plant that my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted. Leave them alone. They are blind. They are blind guides of the blind. And if the blind lead around the blind, both will fall into a pit. So now he gave them a quick parable. And Simon Peter answered, saying to him, my Lord, explain this parable to us. So he, he spoke a lot. In that, and it's, it's, to me, it's funny the, the way that the disciples are, because it's totally different than how I grew up seeing them in church. And he said to them, even yet you do not understand. Now, we're chapter 16 of his ministry or 15 of his ministry, you think that by now they, they caught on his, his style. Do you not know that what, what enters into the mouth goes into the stomach and then through the intestines it is cast out? So this, the food 
just leaves, right? We get the nutrition and, and then it le the, what, what le was not unnecessary goes away. But what comes out of the mouth comes out from the heart and that is what defiles them, that defiles man for the heart. Now, to, in today's language, if I was saying this to English speakers, I say the mind because we think a lot of things kind of originate here, but we're learning slowly that the, the, our whole body is kind of functions together. It's not just this gray matter that does all the thinking. Anyway, <clears throat> so for, for from the heart comes out evil thoughts such as fornication, murder, adultery, theft, false witness, blasphemy. It is these that defile a man, but if a man should eat when his hands are unwashed, he will not be defiled. So taking a tradition of that of, of that that became like you know, it's like you don't wash your hands, so you can't sit at the table, and and people just do the you know the, the touch. I, I see that and unfortunately when, when people even go to the restroom, sometimes they just do a, a wave under the water that has absolutely no effect. Uh, to, to actually deal with the germs and then then they walk into society so so what Jesus was saying here is like that, that's that that's you know showing that I'm compliant but really where we fail is not with the food and I think that's actually this teaching must have been the foundation for when Peter and Paul and later mainly Peter and and the disciples, allowed Gentiles to come in and, and not change their food habits. So throughout Jesus's ministry, when he was alive, pigs were frowned upon. He used them in, in uh, his parables as, you know, like unclean animals. But uh, not now he is, you know, the Christians are known as the ones who eat bacon and so forth uh, versus Muslims who still don't eat uh, uh, bacon uh, or, or any, any uh, pork products. So I think part of it is this, you know, fundamental teaching is that what you eat, if it's good and it's nutritious and it's good for you, uh, and 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 we can keep it safe. More, more importantly, uh, then that that does not affect you. But what festers in you, and the things you say to people, the way you react to them when you see them or when you, when they say something to you, that's where evil is generated. That's where. Uh, you, you are defiled and, and you're, you're separated from your spirituality and, and your essence. So again, don't, don't fear tradition and, and speak out when it's time to do so because it's the right thing to do. Practice your humanity, share your food, share your positive thoughts. Do not judge people for how, what they eat, how they dress their traditions. That's what Jesus was shifting. And he was compiling all this in, in a very short ministry to, to, to shift our whole way to become better human beings and have better, more peaceful existence that's not driven by a constant fear of, you name it, right? Lack of money, lack of food, lack of safety, lack of, you know, somebody breaking in, somebody taking this away, somebody firing you. Fear, 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 fear does not pay off does not you know this is that that kills the soul more than it kills the body as as he kept saying you know when you die you die you go you, you know your body goes away your spirit returns to to its origin but th there is no other effect and, and a lot of people live from that fear of death and, and it paralyzes us in some ways so that that's that's what i really wanted to uh, get into today and uh, I don't see any questions, so this, today might be a, a, a shorter day. But before uh, we switch to Q and A, if, if somebody has a question, uh, Dr. Erico has an announcement to make. A very important one. Good evening, everyone, and that was a wonderful talk. Thank you, Annie. Uh, Thank you. I have a special announcement to make, and this is why we're doing a little break here. You see this book? This is classical Aramaic. And many of you have been writing me, asking me if, when I would teach it. And I'm going to do a five class lesson, five of them. And it's two hours each class. And it's learning the language of Jesus. And it's to read. It's, this isn't to converse in Aramaic. It's not a conversational Aramaic. It is 
to be able to read the teachings of Jesus, read the gospel. And, and in this book here, at the end, I have the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. I have the Beatitudes in Aramaic. You'll learn to read it after the five lessons and <clears throat> of two hours. And I'm going to start this on a Saturday from 10 in the morning till 12. That's two hours. And it starts on the 22nd of July. And then the next four Saturdays after that into August. It'll go into August and probably to the uh, 19th of August. Three in August and two in July. And it'll be two hours. And uh, it, it, I will be doing the teaching, but you have to have this book, the classical Aramaic book. And the, the session runs uh, uh, um, for the five sessions is 125. Plus, you have to purchase this book. Those of you who are members of the foundation, you get a 20% discount on the book. And um, you have to call Lynn. All in, and because I have a set amount I'm going to do, that is, I will have no less than six students and no more than 12. The reason why I have to set it like that is because I like to work personally with the students. And uh, especially doing it on the computer like this, it's not like you're in a classroom. So I like that personal, I try to keep it as personal as I can and as intimate as I can with each student and working with each student and to help them work with them to learn this. Because when you look at this, this is, this is the Estrangela, just look at it. This is the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. And you see it's letters are different. It's not learning French or Spanish or German. At least you're dealing with something that you're used to. But when you're looking at these, they look like scribblings <laughs> and what, Yet it's an alphabet. In fact, our word alphabet comes from Aramaic. Even the Greeks, when they had to do their language, they learned it from the Assyrians. They learned it from the alphabet. That's why they go Aleph. They say Alpha. We say Aleph. They say Beta. Beta is the Aramaic. And in them, it's Beta in also in the Greek, Alabet Gamal, they have that too. And they have all the way through, they, they tell you, I have the Greek books that tell you that they got this from the Assyrians <laughs> who spoke Aramaic. And they did the alphabet and all over the world now, that's what we do. You have to learn the alphabet before you can speak because once you learn the letters, then you can read anything. So there's only 22 letters in Aramaic. So you're going to learn five letters at each session. And we'll do all 20. And you'll be reading by the end of our session of five weeks. So call the foundation. Uh, let's see, I have the number here. Uh, if, if you're out of Georgia, we have an 800 number, which is 1888. 992-8161. And you can talk to Lynn and she'll sign you up. If you're here in Georgia, we are 678-945-4006. And also some of you may want to take the class but can't do it on a Saturday from 10 to 12. We are going to record it. If you register for the class and you get the book, even though you cannot attend, I will send you the link, the personal link to get that particular, all five lessons, but it'll only be for you, only for those who register. So we're gonna need your home address as well, because when we put it up, it'll be on a private, private way uh, to access it. So only so it won't be good for anyone else. It has to be your name and plus the link. So uh, we're going to do that also if you cannot attend 
starting July 22nd and then into the three Saturdays left in August. So sign up, call, and we already have two signed up <laughs> already. And uh, we just need a few more now and we will go ahead with the class. I think that covers it all. Uh, did I leave anything out, Hanny? No, you, you mentioned home addresses, that the email address that you use for your YouTube login. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's where we'll place them and they'll be assigned. The, the recordings will be sent to that uh, email address to access the, the class if, if you're not able to attend or if you want to use it to do reviews, et cetera. No, that's it will only be Thank for you. them. It'll be on a private thing. It won't, the other, yeah. other people cannot access it. won't be able to share it at all. Yeah. No way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank all you. Right. That's it. Okay. We have we do have some uh, questions that this one ca came in, so um, I'll I'll take that next. So, um, and by the way, twelve people, and I've been getting uh, through throughout the the weeks. I've been getting people asking when is Dr. Eric going to do those uh, Aramaic classes. And I've done those with, with him as well as watched him teach uh, different ones. That's how I picked up Aramaic quickly. Uh, that was my beginning. Um, anyway, the, the question that came in, uh, let me just make sure I give it enough time. Oh, we have plenty of time. Um, I have always believed that Lazarus was dead. Why do you say he was at a coma? How would anyone know that? To, to know it definitely, I absolutely agree with you, we can't. But similar to the episode of um, the, the little girl who was also declared dead, um, the, Jesus was not in a hurry. And in, in a way, if Jesus was able, uh, this is using, so, so his attitude when he was informed with that, he read from the people that this is the kind of the kind of thing that they should not think it was death. So that's one of the first clues that that you will see if you read the text is that oh don't worry he'll be you know he'll be fine. So they must have said something ab about the actual like how how, how it happened uh, when you know the, the, the dif different dynamics of it. He might ask more questions. We don't have you know all the the, the, the notes, but what we know is that he did not like drop everything and run uh, even in the episode with with the with the girl who again similar to Lazarus was was declared dead he he stopped and healed a couple people on the way so that tells you that he knew something either from the way they they told him that uh it's so, something is not quite as final as that they're basically in the ground um and then when when he went there and, and worked with that they were very specific. Uh, the, the girl he did not know. Lazarus was more of a friend, so he uh, he, he was dealing with somebody uh, close to him, uh, and maybe knew that he had a condition or he was not doing well, and and that led to his his uh, uh, coma. Uh, but also uh, with with the girl, he did not know her. He did not know anything about her, as far as we know, except what the father said. And he read from that, that it's not too late, that, that she's probably in a coma and I can go help you and assure them that he could help. Um, and then we don't hear about any other. I mean, if, if, if Jesus was really able to raise everybody from the dead, for, and this goes against his ministry because he did not think that death is really a bad thing. He thought when we died, we went back to our spiritual state and he was willing to give up his life. So imagine if he, his ministry was about raising the dead, uh, he would have walked, you know, any anybody for five bucks, ten bucks, or for free. I mean, you know, it just would be waking up dead people all over the place. And what would his criteria be? So I, I really think that it was more in line with his healing ministry than it was in in a miracle of just leaving everything and running to to help a friend come back to life just to live. You know, in in a, a first, I mean, and there are a lot of. I think there is there is quite a bit of writing about how, after he raised Lazarus, somebody came and killed Lazarus to kind of suppress the story and not have a a, a true uh, proof of of the miracle works of Jesus. So there is a lot of lore about 
uh, Lazarus' dad. Now, we don't hear much about the, the girl, and, and his first commandment with the girl is that she probably hasn't had much to eat, and she's been weak, so go ahead and feed her. So so just that the, I, I wish we had all the notes or a video recording of, of how he was informed and how he did this, plus how he was able to actually uh, reach out and pull them out of that state. That, that's healing. And as I said, our medicine is getting better and better at, at working with comas and bringing people uh, back from that state. And not all of it, because not all of it is, is, um, uh, is at the same level. Hopefully this satisfies the uh, the question. And uh, since since I don't have uh, a lot more, uh, I just wanted to say thank you for for joining us. Uh, I won't be speaking. Dr. Erico is going to be probably uh, covering for me. I'm going to be doing some travel and, and and busy for a while. So I'll see you probably August 23rd is the next time I will speak. Uh, in the meantime, enjoy Dr. Erico. I will be keeping an eye on communication on uh, YouTube uh, and uploading the, the videos as Dr. Erico uh, covers them. So, um, uh, and if you do have questions after we hang up, please send them to the foundation and, and Lynn is good at forwarding those to, me, to us. Some we can respond to and some we will take into, into these sessions. Uh, have a blessed rest of your uh, day and until uh, I see you next time.